Right? That's a fun trip for sure. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming tonight. We look forward to our service. We're going to begin with a congregational song, and uh, Brother Dan will introduce that number for us. All right. Please stand and turn to hymn number 337, or it should be on the screen, hopefully. Hymn number 337, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust. Thank you for blessing us so much. Thank you for uh, just uh, letting us uh, come to your house tonight. And uh, just pray that uh, you would just bless everything that goes on tonight, uh, the singing and the preaching, and uh, just, just bless everything. In uh, Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, let's turn over to hymn number 272, I'm on the winning side. <laughs> I drifted out in sin, had no hope nor joy within, and my soul was burdened down with pride. And my Savior came along, and He showed me I was wrong. 
read something to you before we have our next special. This, uh, this was written by a Rwandan man in 1980 uh, who was uh, forced by his tribe to either renounce Jesus Christ or die. He refused to renounce Christ. The night before, he wrote a commitment. You, some of you might have heard it. I, I just want to read it tonight. This is the night before he knew he would die for his faith in Christ. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I won't look back. I won't let up or slow down. I won't back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense, and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living and sight walking and small planning and smooth knees and colorless chintzy giving and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, or position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. I will now live by the presence of Christ. I will lean by faith. I will love by patience. I will lift by prayer and labor by power. My pace is set. My gait is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions may be few. But my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, or lured away, or I will not turn back. I will not be deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of this sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy. I will not ponder at the pool of popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until heaven returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no rec problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. Amen. Wow. Well, I was thinking about that song, I'm on the winning side. If you have a chance to go on YouTube and, uh, and look up Curtis Hudson singing that song. Curtis Hudson sang it at a preacher's conference, I think a couple of weeks before he died of cancer. And um, if some of you know, Curtis Hudson was the editor of the Sword of the Lord newspaper for many years, a great servant of the Lord, tremendous preacher, and got cancer and was slowly dying. Um, and this was, I think this was his last time to preach. Um, and before he preached, 
and he's just a shell of what he used to be. If you can look at some older pictures of Curtis Hudson, just a, 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 strong, a strong preacher, a strong man. And now on this video, if you watch it, he's just frail and, and weak. Uh, but God gives him a voice one more time. And soon to face death and bracked with cancer in his body, he sings, I'm on the winning side. And it's a stirring song. I, it's at a preacher's conference, so you hear, you know, preachers do, everybody says amen. So you hear, you know, everybody's yelling amen in the background. Uh, but uh, what an encouragement that is. It would, uh, we, we are Christians, we follow Christ, and, and this world is never going to be conducive to that. I know we're getting a little frustrated that America's changing. The world has never really been aligned with the, with the disciple of Jesus Christ. And uh, we must follow till he comes, until he calls us home. And, and, and it does mean some rough road, and that's okay. It does mean we have to say goodbye to some friends and, 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 and change many things about our life for his glory. Uh, but it's worth it, isn't it, brothers and sisters? It's worth it. Our Savior's worth that. And it's better living anyways when we follow the Lord. Uh, and to God be the glory. Uh, we have a quartet that's going to sing a song uh, uh, for you now. Myself, Brother Dan. Uh, Miss Beth and Miss Faith.
rescued Daniel from a den of lions, rescued those three Hebrew children from a fiery furnace, right? God can still deliver, amen? We just got to trust him. Sometimes the obedience part is difficult because we don't trust him. But if you trust and obey, it works, right? Just to trust the Lord. I like those three Hebrew children who told Nebuchadnezzar when he said, you either bow or you get thrown in the furnace. And they said, we're not even careful to answer. In other words, we don't have to have a prayer meeting. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to converse. We don't have to huddle. We already know our answer. We're not going to bow. And if we go in the furnace and we die, then we're delivered out of your hand. And if we go in the furnace and God saves us our life, then we're still delivered out of your hand. Either way, we win. And certainly God did deliver them. Amen. They came out of that fiery furnace. And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar went up one. And said, I didn't even smell smoke. How can we not even smell smoke on these guys? And you know what, what is so powerful about that story is their faith influenced a nation. Because on the spot, Nebuchadnezzar said, I command that our, 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 our kingdom now worships the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, Lord, we don't know what's ahead, but whatever it is, God, give us the ability just to stand for his name in these days. Wonderful. Thank you, church family. Uh, Brother Dan. All right, please stand and turn to hymn number 197. Oh uh -huh. 
seated, everyone. Thank you. What a blessing to see four individuals get baptized this morning, wasn't it? And praise the Lord that, uh, you know, souls are still being saved, amen, and, and following Christ in baptism. I reminded of that uh, Ethiopian that said, here's water, what does hinder me from being baptized? And, uh, you know, just because there's water and you have a desire, it doesn't mean you get baptized. You've got to believe in Jesus Christ and then follow uh, him in, in uh, baptism. It's called believer's baptism for a reason. If not, it's just baptism, right? Baptism means, baptized means to immerse and put under. Uh, that's why we baptize by immersion. It's really what it means. Uh, it represents a burial. And so to see those four baptized this morning, which is really them saying that they have been buried with Christ and been risen in a new life. And um, I'm excited to see what God's going to do in their life. Amen. And um, I look back on my baptism fondly. I I was 14 years old when I got baptized. I was six years old when I got saved. And I wasn't permitted to get baptized until I was 14, but oh, how I was so ready when that baptism day came. And I was so excited to actually finally follow. I, my heart, I wanted to for a long time. I just, being a minor, I wasn't permitted. And um, when I was finally able to, I was just so thankful to Christ for that opportunity. And if you've never been baptized, get to it. Uh, we'll warm the water up for you too, right? You hear those people getting out like, ooh, this is nice. <laughs> uh, we will warm it up for you too, no problem, and, uh, and get it all prepared. Um, but thank the Lord. Can we all take our Bibles, and we're still in the book of Psalms, and today will be Psalms 122. Tonight, Psalms 122. All right, Psalms 122, <clears throat> we'll read this together as we've been doing, so I know you just sat, but can we stand again for the word of God? If you're not able to, we understand if you must remain seated, uh, certainly not a problem, but I'll read verse number one. As a congregation, would you please read verse number two, and we'll continue that pattern through verse nine. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord, which is For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Can we pray, please? Father, please use your word tonight to accomplish your pur purpose. I pray that I would be uh, just sort of vanish into the background and the, the Lord Jesus and the Holy Ghost may speak. Uh, Father, accomplish your will. It is a good will we want done on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, convict where conviction is needed. Encourage where encouragement is needed. Provide us the help we need from your word tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you'll take a gander here at Psalms, actually all of from 120, 121, 122, all the way to 134. They all have the same title. Uh, actually, I guess to 134, I mean. They all have the same title. Do you see it? A Song of Degrees. A Song of Degrees. And someone said, is that Fahrenheit or Celsius? No. Uh, a Psalm of Degrees. <clears throat> what is uh, customarily understood to be this little group of psalms that's grouped together is that these were pilgrimage psalms. There's something about music and traveling, isn't there? Right? There's something about traveling, and it's good to have music when you travel. Um, we do it now with electronics, right? We can keep our own elect electronic CDs and, and MP3s and, and YouTube music and, and uh, what's all the other ones? Spotify or, you know, iTunes. Uh, we can keep our own. And as long as we have data coverage and don't go through the mountains, the music keeps playing. 
uh, except when we go through the mountains and we lose our coverage. <clears throat> but uh, when they traveled back then, they didn't have a CD to put in a player. They didn't even have the player. Uh, so they provided their own music. And when they would travel, their own music provision would be people playing instruments and people singing. And so can you imagine a pilgrimage, not in cars, but everybody's on foot, maybe just some animals, some uh, means of, of, of egress, uh, horseback, or, or whatever that may be. And as they travel, and maybe a few are being pulled on, on carts or whatever it may be, but uh, you just hear, you hear instruments and you hear people singing. Must have been, well, it was live music. We know that for sure. And uh, exuberant music. And so these psalms, it is believed that these are the songs especially that were sung as the Jews would travel to Jerusalem. And they had to do this several times a year. Now, throughout the nation, there were synagogues. The Levites were scattered abroad throughout the entire nation, and the Levites would minister and serve in synagogues, which were uh, closer, more local assemblies of worship. But several times a year, the men would go, and a couple of times a year, everyone would go to Jerusalem. And it would be national worship in that city. And the way this psalm is written, it, it, it really would fit with a song being sung on that, on that trip and that journey to Jerusalem. Um, because it says here that the tribes, all the tribes are going. Uh, can you imagine a date being set? Just imagine this, a date being set, and, and forget all of our cars and forget all of our modes of transportation. Let's say that, that all of us still were in, in walking mode, we didn't have these other ways, and, and all of the Christians were, all of the believers were going in one place to worship God, and in groups we all went together and we sang and we played instruments on the trip. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It truly would be great. Um, I wanted to read a couple of Old Testament passages that give us a little taste of some of these journeys. Uh, let's go to 1 Chronicles 13. We'll be back in Psalms in a minute. Uh, but 1 Chronicles 13, we'll get uh, at least two of these instances that revolve around the movement of the Ark of God. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, and we'll read verses 1 through 8. Verse 1 of 13 of 1 Chronicles, And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites which are in their cities and suburbs. I never thought the word suburb was in the Bible, but there it is, right? So the cities and the suburbs, there were suburban Christians back then, <laughs> suburban church, uh, that they may gather themselves unto us. In other words, get everybody here to Jerusalem. Send out the word. We want everybody in every place to get together, get some groups, and we're all coming down here. Let us bring again the ark of God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so. For the thing was right in the eyes of the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shihor of Egypt, even unto the entering of Hemeth, to bring the ark of God from kerjath Jearim. And David went up, and all Israel to Baala, that is to kerjath Jearim, which belonged, belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, uh, ark of God the Lord that dwelleth between the cherubims whose name is called on it and they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Ahio drave the cart and David and all Israel played before God with all their might and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets now, man, that must have been an entourage, right? What, what a group as they all travel with the Ark of God. And, of course, the rest of that story is Uzzah touched the Ark. It's a very interesting chapter. But let's go to uh, chapter 15 of the same book. Chapter number 15 and verse number 14. <clears throat> 
So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel, and the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded, according to the word of the Lord. And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers with instruments of music, psalteries, and harps, and cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So the Levites appointed, I just have to say it, He-Man, the son of Joel, and of his brethren, Asaph. By the way, a lot of the Psalms are written by Asaph. Asaph, the son of Berechiah, and of the sons of Merari, their brethren, Ethan, the son of Cushai, and with them their brethren of the second degree, Zechariah, Ben, and Jaziel, and Shemai, Ramoth, and Jehiel, and Unai, Eliab, and Benaiah, and Messiah, and Matthiah, and Eliphilah, and Mekniah, and Obed-Edom. You all have pity on me now trying to do this. <laughs> and Jeiel the porters. So the singers... Haman, Asaph, and Ethan were appointed to sound with cymbals of brass. Can you hear the singers singing? And every so often just a crash, crash, crash of the cymbals. And Zechariah and Aziah and Shimmai Ramoth and Jehiel and Unai and Eliab and Messiah and Benaiah with psalteries on Elamoth. Uh, let's skip all the names of 21. These people played harps, right? <laughs> See, verse 21, they played the harps. In verse 22, the chief of the Levites, what was he for in verse 22? He was for song. And he was instructed about the song because he was skillful. All right, so uh, Chenaniah, you're going to be the song leader. You know the songs well. You've learned the songs. You've practiced them up. Sing them. And when you sing them, tell everybody to join in with you as you sing. What, what, a, what a group traveling, right? With the Ark of God, going to the city of, of Jerusalem. Uh, and then there were doorkeepers and, and elders. Uh, and verse 25, so David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed, Obed Edom with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that they offered seven bullocks and seven uh, rams. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen. And all the Levites that bear the Ark and the singers, and Chenaniah, the master of the song, with the singers, David also had upon him a, an ephod of linen. And thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of coronet and with trumpets and with cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. And it came to pass as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out, of a, out at a window and saw King David dancing and playing and she despised him in her heart. Wow, what a, what a, visual in our mind of these large groups traveling and while they're traveling they're singing singing playing playing singing singing playing playing it may very well be that every time the groups would travel to jerusalem they would sing some of these psalms in psalms 120 to psalms 134 i think with that in mind that these may be songs that they sung on their way to jerusalem for worship helps us to see psalms 122 in a different light so let's read verse number one of Psalms 122. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now that's probably the one verse that most of us know along with verse number six, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Those are probably the two hallmark verses of the chapter. We're gonna look at all of them tonight because we need all of them. But I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You know, Christians should be glad people. We should be glad people. We have so much to be glad about. And even the things that we would say, you know, I shouldn't be too glad about that. The Bible says that, uh, that all things work together for good. So really, you can be glad about it. You say, well, I, I don't know if I should really be glad about losing my job. I don't know if I should be glad about the doctor saying I need surgery. Well, God's going to do something spectacular and great through it. And it's all going to be for his glory and for our good. 
So a Christian should be glad. A Christian should rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. And again, just in case we miss the simple statement, do it all the time. God says, and again I say rejoice. Double emphatic to do it all the time. And especially, now let me just say this, especially when we are going to the house of the Lord, it should be done with gladness. Right? It's what the Bible says. And here was David said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the, unto the house of the Lord. And, and uh, if you read this verse sort of just carefully, David is not the one saying it. Someone else said to David, let's go. And David said, sounds like a good idea to me. Let's go. You know what we're sort of losing today is we're losing inviting people to church. Um, I remember once Pastor Thompson got up behind the pulpit and said to the church, oh, well, this is the story I heard. I wasn't present this day. But he said, who brought a visitor to church today? And, you know, it's a crowd of several hundred. Maybe the Brunswick's might run with this. I don't know. Who brought a visitor to church today? I think it was a Sunday night. And no one raised their hand. And man, did he get upset. <laughs> For, uh, uh, well, is this the kind of church we, is this the kind of church we want where no one's ever invited and no visitors ever come and we're not uh, uh, inviting someone to come with us? I, I guess it may be harder today. I get it. But it still doesn't mean our invite should be less. It's good when someone else says, let's go. Kids, if your parents say, let's go, praise the Lord. If they say, look, you're getting ready, you're getting up, we're going to the house of the Lord. Be glad you have parents who say, let's go. Amen. I've heard the story about the guy that was under the bed, and he said, I ain't going to church. And his wife came and said, you got to get ready, it's almost time. I am not going to church. And he said, give me one good reason why I should go. And she said, because you're the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Um, call me old fashioned, I guess. But if you're able to get there, get here, get there, get here. I know there are times when we're sick and look, I'm thankful for all the electronics we have. We've never had so much. I mean, I've never been on TV so much in, in, in my life. Uh, every service, it's an hour or so broadcast on YouTube and, and there's my face, you know. And I'm thankful for these electronic advances that we have. If you're sick, you can watch it. It's wonderful, isn't it? If you're out of town, you can watch it. It's wonderful. Uh, if you're disabled, you can watch the service. If you're shut in, you can watch the service. Uh, if you uh, must work, I mean, some of our people, if you're a nurse, I mean, somebody's got to be at the hospital on the weekends. We all understand this. And if you have to work, I, I believe if you, sometimes we work just because we want the money. But if you have to work, if there's a necessity to work, then you can watch the service. But if you can come, come. If you can be here, be here. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the, unto the house of the Lord. Um, all of these mass shootings we've had in our country. Uh, I believe if we'd get going to church more, a lot of that would be solved. You know, you hear all the, the talking heads and the smart ones who give all these solutions on, on what could really make a difference, but no one really, no one really brings up the thing that let's, let's put faith back in the heart again. Let's put faith in God back in the heart. Well, we got separation of church and state. We don't want to, you know, we'll, we'll tell, barely do you hear anyone say pray anymore. But how about this? What if we heard our president say, get to church and pray this Sunday for our nation? But you won't hear that said. You won't hear it. There is something good about being in the house of the Lord. It is good. Now, there are some places I don't like to go. But I've always liked coming to church. Ever since I was a teenager, I've always loved coming to church. When I got saved at six years old and just started coming to Sunday school, when the bus would stop by my house, I wanted to get on it. When I got a little bit older, I wanted to start working on the bus. When I heard that there was Sunday night church in Wednesday night, I didn't even know there was Sunday night Wednesday night church. All I knew was from the bus to a Sunday school room and back to the bus. And when someone told me when I was in my early teens that, yeah, we have church on Sunday night, Wednesday night. And someone said, would you like to come? You know what I said? Of course I want to come. 
I don't have a way to get there. But if someone will pick me up, I will come. I think a healthy Christian wants to be in the house of the Lord. I'm not trying to be legalistic about it. But when the choice is either worship with the saints and sing the songs. Look, you can worship alone, but worshiping with others is awesome. You can sing alone, but singing with others is awesome. You can read the Bible alone, but preaching is different. You know, preaching is for a decision. I hope we understand that. Teaching is maybe more for the, for the intellect, but preaching has always been designed for decision. Uh, I heard this week they said that singing makes you feel good, preaching makes you live good. <laughs> that's, I think that's sort of true. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there, there's a uniqueness to the preaching of the Word of God that, that, that changes our living. And it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Some places I don't like to go. Uh, my wife will tell you, I don't like shopping. She knows. Uh, I like being with her, so I'll go sometimes. Because <laughs> I like being with her. But if I'm going to shop on my own, and maybe all of us men can testify, I don't like it. <laughs> Uh, I want to get in and get out as fast as I can. Uh, I, I don't like uh, the turnpike. We went to Philadelphia and back, and we were planning our route. There was two routes. One was you take the sort of the long way up north with no tolls, or you take the, the sh little shorter way uh, south with tolls. And now Google shows you on there, it's only $55 in tolls. $55. And now you don't even see the money leaving your wallet with Easy Pass. It just sort of comes out like in mystery mode. But you know you're paying it somewhere. I don't like driving the toll road. I especially don't like Philadelphia traffic. If you've ever been to Philadelphia, and I know other major cities are probably the same, that place is gridlock all the time. Uh, no matter what time of day uh, you arrive. Um, maybe we're all in this boat. And, and I'm, I'm not, I don't like going to the dentist either. <laughs> I don't like going to the doctor either. Seems like every time I go to the doctor, there's something new that they find. And I'm healthier when I'm not there because they don't know. Someone says, do you have high blood pressure? I said, never been checked. <laughs> How about your cholesterol? Don't know. <laughs> I guess the day will come when I have to go, but I don't like going. But I know we laughed a little bit. But I do like coming to church. And I want to encourage you tonight. Um, when we want to separate and not be present, we really should talk to the Lord and find out why. Why is it? Maybe there's some kind of personality problem, or, or a lot of times it's because we're becoming carnal and following the world. But I, I'm just encouraged that David had somebody say, let us go to the house of the Lord. And when David heard that, it made him glad. It made him glad. The idea of canceling services, and I'm, I'm not here to, I, I want to support the work of the Lord in churches. But I do believe that we need more of the word of God, not less, as the coming of the Lord draws near. Amen. Well, <clears throat> they was, uh, he was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Verse number two brings another aspect to it when David said, my feet shall stand within the gates of Jerusalem. In other words, I'm going to be there in person. I'm going to be right there, face to face. I pray there's not another COVID uh, thing that spreads, or, or anything like it. Because there is nothing to compare with your feet being in the house of the Lord. With your feet being here. Your person being here. Your body being here. Uh, when we went to this conference this, uh, this last week, I've tried, you know when you try to tell people about it? You know? Uh, I, I announced this morning some of the services are five hours long. And people are like, what? Are you kidding me? I wish I could convey that when you're there and it's over, you, you almost feel like it's over. That's, that's over. Now your body's tired, and no question about that, you do get fatigued, and they always feed us afterwards, so you're sort of hungry, uh, want to get the pizza or whatever afterwards, but it's over. Oh, to have your feet there. It's hard to explain the blessing of the house of the Lord unless your feet are there and you're in it. And to participate. The Bible also says in verse number three, he talks about Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. We've been to Jerusalem. It's the old city of Jerusalem. When you think of the city of Jerusalem, you think like our cities. It's nothing like our cities. 
it's like one big structure almost, right? It's like everything is connected. It really, when the Bible talks about a wall being around the city and everything sort of being, and others have been there, it's, it's like one thing. It's, it's compacted. It's like puzzle pieces put together. So all of these things sort of together in, the, in this beauty of like, like a puzzle, that it is one compact together place. And David was saying, I cannot wait to get there because I enjoy Jerusalem. It's a beautiful city, especially the way it's all compact together, so tight and so close uh, and so integrated and so, so connected. It's compact together. Now there's another scripture that talks about compact, and I want to, uh, if you wouldn't mind looking at it in Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 16. Verse 16 says, from whom the whole body, now of course we know that we often refer to a church as a body and the believers as a body and Ephesians here also is referring to the unit of believers in Christ as being a body. Now look what it says about the body. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and then there's that word compacted. Compacted. Just like the word in Psalms 122, compacted. And this word compacted accentuates the phrase fitly joined together. Sort of like the city of Jerusalem is all of these pieces that are building connected to building, connected to building, connected to building, nothing in between. Store on top, you know, lodging on top, store on the bottom, and it's all sort of connected in this one glob of a city, a beautiful compact city. And the Bible says that the family of God, the body of Christ, is also fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase in, of the body unto the edifying of itself. Hmm. Well, I want to say that the church family is also compact together. There is a connectivity, a connectedness in a church that is unprecedented anywhere else. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. You can golf with someone, but I find that most Christians golf with friends at church. And that's terrific. Because there's a compactness together. There's a connectivity here were all the tribes of Israel going together to Jerusalem. And when they would all get there, they would be tight and close and compact. And they would pray and rejoice and sing and give thanks. And they would do all that together as one unit. Compact together. One of the blessings of being part of a church is that we're all compact together. We're in this together as a body. David also noted in Psalms 122, not only the beauty of the city as its, uh, and, its, and its makeup and its, its uh, design, but in Psalms 122, he also says that they gave thanks. If you'll look again at this great psalm in verse number four, I think it is. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, under the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the of the Lord. Gratitude. Gratitude. When they would gather in this, in this national center, this capital city of Jerusalem, where the king would be and where the governance was and where the tabernacle was, when they would gather here, one of the primary purposes of their gathering was thanksgiving. And there's so much about, I, I, I know you can see we're making parallels here with the, lo the local church of the New Testament, but isn't this a time of thanksgiving tonight? It's a time of thanksgiving in the morning. You say, well, what was I thankful for? My heart was filled with gratitude and thanksgiving to God to see four people baptized this morning. I was just praising the Lord. I was praising the Lord to be back home. Now, I know I, I loved my, our time away. We were together as a family. It was a tiring time, but a wonderful time of recharge. But I don't, I, I don't know how to express this to you. It was great to be home. 
And I was thanking the Lord about being home with you, my church family, my friends, and my loved ones. There was exciting Thanksgiving when they would gather in the house of, of, of the Lord and the, and the capital city. And imagine the Thanksgiving when the ark of God came back home. You'll have to read through the story in First Chronicles, but when, when Uzzah talked, touched the ark and Uzzah died, well, they left the ark at the house of Obed-Edom. David said, we, we're not taking it any further. We've already had one person die. He touched the ark when, when they were carrying it the wrong way, by, uh, by the way. So they left it at the house of Obed-Edom. And the whole time it's at the house of Obed-Edom, his life is blessed. <laughs> it's a great read. I mean, his, he is blessed in every way when the ark of God is there. Well, finally, David says, we got to go get the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom and bring it home. And that's what we read in, in 1 Chronicles chapter number 15. And you can just feel the energy and feel the excitement. I can hear David saying to that one guy, look, you know the song? Yeah, I know the song. Well, you better sing the song good. Because we are bringing the ark of God home, and I want you to lead it like you've never led it before. And this guy, I don't remember his name, says, all right, I'll do it. And, and so they sing, and the cymbals are crashing, and the people are even dancing as they're coming home uh, with the ark of God. But it was an exciting Thanksgiving time. Thanksgiving's not just in November. Amen. Thanksgiving is every time we come to the house of the Lord. And I, I, I don't talk a lot about this, but I'm going to land on it for a minute. When we give our tithes and offering, you know what that is? Thank you, Lord. Hear me now. Lord, you've been so good to me and provided so much for me and been so gracious to me and given me everything I've needed and most of what I've wanted. And I offer my thanksgiving to you cheerfully as I give. It's a wonderful time of thanksgiving. It was where they heard sound judgment. In verse number five, for there are set thrones of judgment and the thrones of the house of David. And even the testimony of Israel in verse number four is probably the tablets that were inside of the ark. And this was sound judgment. You know how the word of God should be understood line upon line, precept upon precept. I know churches, we struggle with these things. And in our new building, we're trying to wrestle everything together and, and make sure that we can sort of hit the ground running when we're there. Uh, but we, you know, a lot of times when people call, they want to know what programs are here. And they want to know, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, they, they check, now we check Google reviews. <laughs> does the church have four stars, five stars, three stars? How many stars does the church have? And uh, there's all sorts of reasons for going to a church, I guess. And uh, I've even known some people who said, man, you've got to go to this church. They have the best coffee any place. <laughs> and I, I guess if that's the reason, you know, sometimes young people go to a church because there's a girl there, a friend there that they want to see. Uh, but you know why we really should go to the house of the Lord? For thanksgiving and sound judgment. Amen. Thanksgiving and sound judgment. To be able to hear from the word of God our pathway of duty and be encouraged in righteousness for the Lord. These are the best two reasons and any other reason will disappoint you. You say, well, I'm going to be with my friends. What if your friends aren't there that day? Well, I'm going because I love to hear so-and-so sing. What if he or she isn't singing that day? Well, I'm going because, you know, uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, they, they, they always have donuts. What if the donuts don't arrive? God forbid if the donuts don't arrive. What if they don't arrive? But if we come for thanksgiving and the word of God, the judgment of the word of God, it always fills us up, doesn't it? The word of God fills us. Then the Bible goes on to the subject of peace. And this is where I want to end tonight, peace. Verses 6 through 8. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. And I'll just say in passing, I pray that our nation will always be in favor of Israel and Jerusalem. Because they shall prosper that love thee. It's a scripture promise. And pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Peace be within thy walls, prosperity within thy palaces, and so forth and so on in these passages. Pray for Jerusalem. Can I just say tonight, pray for your church too. Pray for your church. Pray for me. Sometimes we're so quick to criticize things in the church and so slow to pray for things in the church. But pray for your church. And especially pray for there to be peace there. I know prosperity is mentioned in verse number six. 
Uh, but prosperity is always secondary to peace. In other words, you can have prosperity and lack peace. But peace always seems to be accompanied with prosperity. And I'm not saying just money. But a person who is peaceful seems to be prosperous. Even if the bank account is nothing. And the clothes are old and worn. And, and the car, you know, um, we may not have a lot of land. We may not have a lot of space. We may not have a lot of things. I heard about a rancher who wanted to impress the preacher and brought him over his house. And, and uh, uh, the uh, the rancher said, I got so much, uh, he said, I, I could start my truck in the morning and I would still be on my property by the end of the day. And the preacher said, I had a car like that once. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> we may not have a lot, but peace, what a blessing when you have peace. Especially peace with God. Peace with God is, one of, is, is, is the one thing that everyone needs before they depart into eternity. Have you made your peace with God, we often will say. And the only way to have peace with God is through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is the Savior. But the reason they're praying is because no one wanted hostility in Jerusalem. This is how I want to close. No one wanted there to be disunity, discord, uh, violence, hostility in Jerusalem. So as they're going up, one of the things they're praying is they're saying, let's pray that in Jerusalem when we get there, we're going to the house of the Lord. Let's pray that when we get there, that there will be peace there. Peace there. Not just the absence of war, but I think the peace that they wanted was peace between each other. You've got to sort of picture this. Those 12 tribes were... were they were diverse. And there were some schisms even between tribes that went historically back. So if you're coming from one of the northern tribes, remember the nation was divided at one point, north and south. If you're coming from a northern tribe and a southern tribe and Judah thinks they're the best tribe and then you got these little tribes and, and, and the Levites are all, the tribe of Levites sort of scattered everywhere and, and they're all coming in here, all different places, all different locales, all different sort of backgrounds and all different pieces. And they're coming to one place. And the thing that's mentioned here is let's pray that there'll be peace. Peace. Especially for the brethren. So it's said here in verse 8, for my brethren and companions' sake, let's pray for peace. I'm not worried about war breaking out in the church. I've really never been worried about, you know, you know guns blazing and, and a group coming to take us hostage. or never really been worried about that. But there has been always a worry and concern on my heart. And that's that this local body will be at peace with each other at peace with each other. That one, little, that one little element of peace, the New Testament calls it unity, one accord. You know, they were all with one accord. That thing of one accord and unity is priceless for a church family. Peace. They wanted it so much they were willing to pray for that and the prayers that they offered up were on the sake of their brethren and companions. To pray. To pray for unity. To pray for harmony. Romans chapter number 12, verses 3 through 21. I won't read it for sake of time. But the first two verses we know, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. You start with verse 3 and go all the way to verse 21. I encourage you to do it in your own time. Verse 3 to 21 is all about unity among believers. In fact, those scriptures about vengeance is mine, I will repay, and, and render not evil for evil, that's all in Romans chapter number 12. And especially among the people of God, to have peace. Pray for that peace. And seek that harmony. Um, when I was in the high school band with Paul Rausch, who was one of my heroes um, for the faith, and, and uh, encouraged me musically uh, in so much, of, of many ways, uh, he's the one that convicted me to, or convinced me to play the trombone. <laughs> and uh, I remember we would get ready for our, for our band concerts. 
And back then, I mean, the band, you know, we had 30, 40, maybe even more players in the, in the, in the high school band. And um, the night that we're playing or the, the evening of the concert, I mean, it is a, it is a buzz of uh, everything. I mean, we got to make sure our clothes match. Everybody's supposed to wear a red tie and a black jacket. And we're trying to get our music all set up and get the stand set up. And everybody's running hither and yon. But one thing we had to be is we all had to be in tune. So here we are all wanting to be in tune. And this is before the days of the electronic gizmos. So Mr. Roush, who played the clarinet, would be running all around doing his thing. And we all knew that we had to go find Mr. Roush and have him tune us up. So I don't know what note he played on the clarinet, but I would, I would go up to Mr. Roush and say, okay, I need to tune up. All right, all right. And he always has clarinet with him all the time. He go, and uh, he says, go ahead, play your, play your B flat. He said, you got to go lower, got to go lower. I'll move the slide down. And he and I would do that for, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds until my sound matched his sound. And I was in tune with him. And then whoever played the flute, whoever played the other instruments would have to find Mr. Roush and say, Mr. Roush, tune me up. And he, and they would all tune up to Mr. Roush. And then when we all got to playing, we were all in tune with each other because we all tuned to the same person. And I've often wondered, how can a church stay unified and in harmony? It's not so much us staying in tune with each other. It's all of us staying in tune with God. Because if we all stay in tune with God, this happens automatically. It's when we get out of tune with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's when the world creeps in, when carnality creeps in, when self creeps in, when pride creeps in, that it messes up our harmony one with another. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and our heart completely connected to him at all times. And if it ever feels like with our ears that we're sort of getting out of tune with the church family, it's probably because we're a little out of tune with God. And we may have to go find the Lord again in prayer and say, Lord, tune me up. Tune my heart. Tune my life so I can be in harmony with one another. They prayed for the peace of Jerusalem and peace with their brethren and peace with their commandments, companions. And when they arrived and worshipped and the ark of God came, uh, you can read through it there on the celebration they had when the ark of God arrived. And man, what a celebration it was as they gathered and rejoiced and thanked God for his goodness. I think we get a little taste of that every time we gather as God's people. And it should sort of cause us to say, I'm glad when anybody says, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen, church family? Amen. Can we bow our heads together for prayer for a moment? Well, I don't want to preach a whole other sermon for the invitation. We've all heard what the Word of God said, and I, I know, I mean, clearly these are the things that God gave me in my heart for me first, and I've shared it with you. But how, how, well, whatever it is, we just need to pray, talk to the Lord. Let's pray for our churches, pray for pastors, pray for the body of Christ to be in harmony. Pray for the gathering of the saints to be with gladness and rejoicing. Pray for us to be able to have thanksgiving along with the sound judgment of the word of God. Pray for our brethren and companions in this journey. Whatever the need is tonight, just a chance to pray, make decisions, talk to the Lord, settle it, make it right. Will you stand with me with your head bowed? Pastor Matt will come lead us in prayer tonight. Dear Father, we come before you tonight. Lord, we thank you so much for the message we heard tonight, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, Father. We thank you for our church family, Father, for this wonderful thing that you've, you've given us here, Father. This is just not a bunch of people that have gathered together by chance, Lord, but by your election. 
Lord, you brought us together as a family, Father. We thank you so much for this church family, Lord, that we, that we are the pillar and ground of truth through the Holy Spirit. Let's pray that you bless this time of invitation, Father, Lord, that you would um, cause us to um, get rid of any division. Help us to be in tune with you, Father, to love one another out of a pure heart fervently as you've given us commandment. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us, and just pray that you bless this time of invitation. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll let her play through this verse and chorus just as we pray. Let's go back and do that chorus. Sing the chorus with me. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, Thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, Thine we are. You may be seated, everyone. Pastor Matt. Amen. Have our ushers come forth this time. What a wonderful Sunday. Amen. It's so good to be here tonight. Praise God for our church family, for the messages we heard this morning and tonight. And of course, once again, those that were baptized this morning, praying for them. Let's pray for them. Keep them in your prayers. You know, the devil's uh, going to attack them any way he can, like he does us. But they've, uh, they've made, they've, they're following the Lord in believer's baptism. They're, they're choosing to serve Jesus Christ. God help us to help them. Amen. And serve the Lord together. Cole, could you lead us in a prayer, please? Lord, we thank you for the message that we heard today. Lord, we thank you for the voices that can sing. Lord, protect us from division, Lord, and uh, protect us from strain from, uh, from your word, Lord, and from your house. Lord, help us keep us close, Lord, keep us in, in your house, Lord. We ask this on your name. Amen. 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 Well, in two weeks is our family Sunday here at Southwest Baptist Church with the Tices. They'll be here with us. He'll be preaching. Of course, he's going to be the one that's leading our um, Kingdom Family Marriage Retreat going on Friday and Saturday, and then he'll be here, of course, Sunday to continue to preach on Sunday morning and Sunday night. So we're excited about that, what God has there, and um, we're looking forward to a good time. Looking forward to the marriage retreat, amen? And uh, we know that God's going to bless it. It's so good. I just praise God for my wife and my family and for our church family, Amen. And I praise God for the joy that he gives us through these things. And God is wonderful, isn't he? Yes. So looking for a good time. We're going to praise God for what we had to look forward to here. Of course, Sunday evening after the service with the Tices, um, there's going to be a, uh, a fellowship going on afterwards. More details will be announced about that here in the near future. The things maybe we can bring and just uh, spend some time with fellowship together and have a good time after the evening service. Things happening here this week, of course, this Tuesday is our Willowwood Care Center. As you can see in your bulletins there, keep that in your prayers. It'll be a part of that if you can. And uh, we know that would be a blessing to you. But continue to pray for that ministry there at the Care Center. And, of course, our midweek service. Let's not forget to be here, to be encouraged in the Lord, and to be encouraged by the preaching of God's Word. And praise God for our, um, what's going on with our kids' class on Wednesday nights and Wednesday morning as the Revelation Bible study is um, resuming. So we're looking forward to having a good time there Wednesday morning, also at 930. And, of course, next Sunday is Cody Rich Missionaries to Zimbabwe. That will be with us. And praise God for our missionaries. Amen. We are missionaries also. Amen. We're looking forward to hearing from them and what God has laid on their heart and what God is doing in their ministry there in Zimbabwe. And, of course, August 9th is Haven of Rest, and that's our mission here. Amen. So be a part of that if you can. Pray for that if you would. And we know that God's going to continue to do a great work there as we continue to pray and we seek the Lord. Go ahead and stand. We've dismissed the word of prayer. New church address book is going to be, uh, they're going to be making a new one. So there's a blue sheet in the back there in the lobby as you leave. Um, if you need, have some updated information you need to add to that, just go ahead and write that down and give that to Charlotte or Sarah as we can get that new uh, address book updated and accurate. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Father, for your word and, Lord, for your promises. Where two or three are gathered together, there you are in the midst, Father. We thank you for your presence in the message here tonight, Father, and among your people, Lord. We just pray that you strengthen our families, Father, draw us close to you. Uh, Lord, uh, strengthen us, Lord, and Lord, lead, guide, and direct us this week. We need you, Father. We love you. We just pray, Lord, that you just bless our families, Father. Yes. Strengthen us, Lord. We need your strength. We need your direction. 
We need your Holy Spirit in everything we do, Father, for without you we can do nothing. Mm. We thank you so much for the message we heard tonight, Father. And thank you for your word. And just pray that you bless us, Lord, and give us a good week. Lord, help us to follow after you, Lord, and look to you in all things. We love you. We thank you, Father, for all you've done for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.